Welcome, everybody, to the latest Zoom edition of the Writer's Block on the Needham Channel. I'm Matt Robinson. And having been in the media world for longer than I care to uh, remember right now, it's, uh, you know, everyone's had challenges this year, of course, but uh, business-wise, media has been a tough game. Uh, and so to have someone who's been in that world for, for over 50 years is uh, quite a testament. And that's why I'm really uh, so happy and so proud to have someone I consider a colleague, a mentor, and a friend, Mr. Jordan Rich. Jordan, say hello to the people. Hello, people, and hello, Matt. And I love your backdrop, not because my book's there, but because I see, yes, thank you, but I also see yours, which I love. Uh, yeah. Told me all about the Ivies. Thank you, it's an honor to be with you, my friend. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, just, to, well, to talk about the book, it's, it's called On Air, My 50-Year Love with Radio. And, you know, it, it tells about a lot of things we're gonna talk about today, just how Jordan came up in the business, uh, the people he's met along the way, the lessons he's learned. And from, from, from what I know of you, it's just the people that you've touched really seems to be the, the most important part. You, you, you do so much for the, for the community with your, in addition to the broadcasting, you do MC work and hosting and, and fundraising. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to all that. Uh, I guess I'll let you tell people, you know, what, what first got you the, the broadcasting bug, as it were. Well, we should first relate to the audience that I am indeed 50 years in the business, sort of. When I say 50 years, I mean, I'm, look at me, I'm, I'm barely 40. Right. So it doesn't yeah, make any I sense could, mathematically. I couldn't figure out the math, but I'm, an, I'm a writer, so I don't do math. <laughs> no, I, I got the bug at a very young age. Um, unlike a lot of my colleagues and contemporaries who were listening to music on the radio, I was fascinated by people talking. And as you'll note, I talk a lot. And as a result, Matt, in, in, in my early years, six, seven, eight years old, I'd be in bed at night with my little portable radio listening to stations across the country with the skip waves. And I was just fascinated that people could uh, talk or, or, or tell you what's happening in a baseball game or tell a joke, um, and they'd be hundreds of miles away. So anyway, long story short, I loved theater and acting in high school, and there was a radio club, a radio program, um, very basic where we just would interview people as they came through the school and I got hooked and uh, realized uh, looking at the body that I was blessed with and Tom Cruise's height I would probably be better off behind the scenes <laughs> behind the screen as opposed to in front of it so I got the the bug early I'd say at eight or nine got my first tape recorder and it was on from there who, who were some of your uh, your your mentors like uh, you know the, the 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 deans and dons of uh, Boston area radio when you were growing up well, in Boston radio, and we have a lot of listeners who will associate the, these names with the legends they are, um, I grew up listening to the likes of Jess Kane, who was a morning host at WHDH for almost 40 years. Uh, WBZ, where I, is still my home. I mean, the likes of Carl DeSouz and Dave Maynard and some giants, Norm Nathan, who became a true mentor, um, Gary LaPierre and all of these greats. And, uh, and then there were people from other parts of the country, and some of whom I, I got to know. Um, talk show hosts, uh, Barry Farber, for instance, out of New York, uh, Bill Deal in New, New York as well, an ABC correspondent, so many others. And, um, uh, and then I got to know uh, later on some of the talk show legends, Jerry Williams, David Brudnoy, whom I worked with. And that was really a kick. So those are the, those are the, the heroes of mine in the broadcast beat in the Boston market. What, what was the format of your first show? Do you remember, do you remember who your first guest was or the first topic? Uh, well, if you go way, way back to high school, it was fascinating. I was probably uh, interviewing some high powered guests, the head of janitorial services for Randolph high school. You know, what is it about janitors, mops and people throwing up at the, in third grade that those were the types of questions that we oh, were yeah. fielding. Uh, <laughs> no, but seriously, right on the top. I, I, even in my high school, we had a wonderful uh, coordinator who took us on trips with a microphone and a tape deck to the South Shore Music Circus in Cohasset, oh, wow. where we would interview certain stars. I know one of, I didn't get a chance, some kids interviewed Bob Hope one year at, wow. you know, they barely knew who he was, right. but it was really fun. And then later on, I mean, uh, I think my first, one of my first celebrity interviews, um, might have been um, with a vampirologist, not really a celebrity, but a weird guest to have as one of my first, I'm interviewing a vampire, but it's really strange. But uh, through the, I will talk about this if you want, through the years, I've had the great pleasure of meeting 
literally hundreds of celebs as they're known and got some good stories for those as well. Yeah, I de definitely want to get to some of your uh, fav favorite stories, but um, I also wanted to mention that along the way to BZ, you were at SSH and RKO, and you even made a stop in our lovely town of Needham. Can you tell us about the, your Needham connection? Well, I love Needham, first of all. Uh, great town, have a lot of friends there. Uh, taught for a while in Needham at the Connecticut School of Broadcasting, which I believe is still there, right by Channel 5. I've done a lot of work at Channel 5 and have a, a lot of uh, radio and TV colleagues who've lived or worked in Needham. But I also worked up in Lowell in the Merrimack Valley. Uh, That's for a couple my, of years. my birthplace, WCAP, something like that? Yeah, WLLH. Oh, were, LLH, were, sure, yeah. And there were those two stations competing. And then uh, that led to, to SSH. But what's interesting about that call letter jumble is that um, they're all within you know 50 miles. So I never had to do what so many radio guys end up doing you know, go out to Ohio or Cle or or Wisconsin or, and work my way back. I was lucky enough, even when I lost a couple of gigs in the Boston market, to stay within the, the confines of New England. Very yeah, lucky. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, from the writing side or the broadcasting side, it's, it's a competitive market. Yeah. Again, testament to your, to your talent. Who was the one who first told you, you, you know, you had the voice, that, that this really could be be something? Well, it's interesting. My voice changed uh the puberty thing happened for me kind of early which which leads us to a topic on another show you know <laughs> young boys and puberty and whether or not it really makes sense to happen early <laughs> but seriously uh i my voice changed when i was about 13 and it wasn't trained or anything but it was deep and rich and low and as a result matt i was able to escape the bullies in high school because i just used my voice <laughs> They thought, I, they thought I was a vice principal coming around the corner. It was just me throwing my voice. No, seriously, um, I, I guess in college, I had a, a professor. Her name was Kitty McCann. And if you can picture a professor with the bun and the granny glasses and the ruler and the arts, she was very strict. But she sort of whacked around uh, the concept that you gentlemen, call this gentlemen, uh, need to uh, pronounce your words and enunciate your words correctly, enunciate correctly, and that Boston accent has to go. So that's where I learned how to train my voice to start, and then I've been working on it ever since. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, 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 it's, it's, there's an advantage to having a deep voice. There's a disadvantage to having my voice because uh, no matter where you are in a restaurant, you'll know what I ordered. <laughs> 50 tables across, and my voice just carries. So it can be dis not advantageous as well. Well, speaking of uh, your voice in public, do you, do you often have people coming up to you saying, I, I know your voice, but I can or can't place it? It's rare, and, and, but it does happen occasionally, mostly at tables in restaurants. Yeah, I'll have the, uh, the chicken, uh, broiled chicken. I know you. You're, what's his name? They usually <laughs> get that. Um, it's interesting, and you know, because you've been in the media yourself, when you're a TV local weather person or sports or something, or even a, just a TV correspondent, as soon as you become a TV person, everyone knows who you are. Oh, that's him. He's on TV. The beauty of being in radio, you can do it for 40 years and sneak right through any line. Nobody bothers you for the most part. For the, I most part. Think the thing I always love is, is, you know, when you do the voiceover work, like when you do the, the announcements for the local events and organizations. And I, I tell people, it's like, that's Jordan, I know him. <laughs> well, the weirdest thing is I've been on for so long and I've recorded thousands of hours, hundreds of thousands of hours. And every once in a while, I'll hear myself driving along, I'm driving along and I don't know it's me. That sounds familiar. <laughs> and, and it's always the case, voiceover people will appreciate this. When you record something, when you've had a cold, one year. In 1989, I had a cold and they repeated that spot for the next 15 years. And I go, ah, I got to listen to that again. Yeah. Yikes. I, I remember uh, I was at, when I was doing my music writing, you know, bands just come up to me and thank me for the great review. But I'd gone to so many shows, I, they were, I literally couldn't remember. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, it was, it was terrific. Huh? <laughs> well, you have to do what you have to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I've had people you know, say, but if, if they got something out of it, you know, that, that's, that's, why, that's why we do it. No, it's true. When I wrote the book, and, and not to shamelessly plug the book, but when I wrote it, what was really good about this, and you're a writer, and I'd love to get your take on this too, 
it, it forces you to recall and rebuild your, your past and not to remake it, but to sort of re reposition it. So you understand where you were, what you were doing when, and I re remembered things that I've totally forgotten about. And, uh, and people come up to me all the time. You remember that time? And when you interviewed me in 2007, uh, Oh, sure. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> But they mean hey, as long as like I said, as long as they remember and they got something out of it, exactly. you know, especially exactly. the, these in the lean years, it makes it makes uh, makes what we do worthwhile. So in addition to your radio work, you've been working uh, with Ken Carberry at, at Char Productions, where you do like uh, sound production. How, how did you meet Ken and, and how did that all come about? And, and how has that, I guess, expanded your 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 repertoire? Well, it's expanded my repertoire and it's, it's been my life since 1976. We met in school in a communications radio intro class, hit it off, had a great time working at the small college radio station and realized soon after that, you know, this is so much fun. Why don't we try to make a living at this? I mean, really, what we didn't know what the heck we were doing, but it was 1978 and the disco era had really been hot. So we decided to, uh, to try our hand as mobile disc jockeys. And we didn't, again, know very much what we were doing, but how difficult could it be? You put a record on, people dance, right? So we ended up doing that. And then that morphed into uh, the idea of doing what we call production in the audio world, which is voice work and commercials and creative stuff. And uh, we just kept going and we've been going 42 years in the business. Um, you know, Ken, you've met him and, and you've, done such a great job with me at, at Chart Productions for WBZ. But uh, Ken is a very amiable, loving chap, and we get along famously. We're, you know, we're best of friends and best of partners, which is rare. Yeah, right. So uh, just to put it in a nutshell, we, we do everything and anything that has to do with audio, and that can be uh, uh, recording somebody else, editing somebody else's work, or recording things that, that we do for other companies and other services, narrations, commercials, promos, public service announcements, that kind of thing, as well as podcasts. Yeah, you've been doing podcasts and audiobooks and really just kind of keep keeping up with the times, which is uh, another, another rare thing these days that you do it all and do it all pretty well. Well, I'll tell you, Matt, um, I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a Luddite, but I'm not a technically advanced human, although Ken is much more advanced than I am. But uh, you have to, and I'm sure you're, you're in the writer's show you're doing, you're experiencing this with writers and you yourself, you have to be up on the latest technology for deliverable and you have to stay current. I mean, if we were not paying attention to the podcast boom, we would just miss out and probably be, be ready to fold up shop because things have changed so much. So yeah, yeah. But I, I figured this out, <laughs> working, right? Yeah, that's so so good. Um, when did you get into uh, hosting an MC, or did that sort of come from the DJing, just sort of being the host of an event? And you know, that's it's so interesting because I loved theater. I was on stages throughout high school, and even in high school, I was asked to MC a local assembly or MC something at the town square, and I just sort of took to it. And um, and over the years, every radio job I've had, including my job as a weather caster the stations always asked me to sort of show up and MC and host and coordinate. I did done auctions and fashion shows and all this kind of stuff. And I think it's because, um, uh, you know, it's no real skill beyond just being fast on my feet and understanding when it's time to shut up and move on that kind of thing. I'm very good at that. So, um, I'm the, I'm the one guy who has the utmost respect for, um, and I just forgot his name because that's the nature of being old. The host of American Idol for so many years, you know, the guy who hosts everything these days. Oh, Ryan Seacrest. Thank you. Thank you. I know I could count on you. I have respect and admiration for him. Most people take it for granted because it's such a challenge to be able to sort of weave your way into a situation, smooth things out, move things along, get things done, and be entertaining at the same time. I really appreciate what he does. So I love it, man. I'm doing a fashion show as we tape this next week. Um, and I've got, uh, you know, I've done uh, Symphony Hall, I've done The Garden, and done Garden Party. So I've done it all. It's really fun. It's also allowed you to get in uh, to support a lot of organizations that, that are important to you. So what, what are 
what are, before we get into your you know the most profound interviews and and celebrity meetings what what are some of the events that are closest to your heart or that you know that you really like kind of revisiting while writing your book well as you know when you delve into something uh in your in your work world that that intersects with the outside world and that outside world is calling to you no matter what it might be and you have the ability and the opportunity to do something and in my case what what is my opportunity afford it, en it enables me to inform people and educate them about something and bring attention to something and, and sometimes be a fundraiser as well so it's been a variety of causes i think the most personal cause would be cancer research I know you're very active in terms of researching certain um, disease function that has affected your family. Same with me. Yeah. Um, and I've, I get such a kick and it's a high and I know what you, you know, you know me well enough to be able to bring somebody on the air and have them promote their cause or show up to promote a cause. It just is giving back a little in and, and feels great. The energy I get from that. So, Long, long story short, um, most of my work has been through organizations that have contacted me. The one big one is Children's Hospital in Boston because that for decades was a WBZ official charity, WBZ Radio. And when I started 26 years ago, it was just sort of petering out because Dave Maynard, a well-known name, was in semi-retirement. And so they, they kind of just, I don't want to say dropped the ball, but they it ebbed the whole children's hospital thing. And I just picked it up off the floor and said, let me run with this on my own and in the late night. And it's become my, my charity du jour ever since. Yeah, you do, you uh, do that, that wonderful, wonderful book that you, that you make for them. And, and just, yeah, it's a great, great Yeah, we, we had, uh, I think about a dozen or 15 booklets comprised of poems and stories and recipes where listeners sent in. We did three CDs and a lot of radiothons. So really fun. All right, well, speaking of the book, let's, let's get to why, why, you know, what, what got us here to this particular moment. What, what prompted you to, to put the book together and why, you know, what, were, what were the messages you were hoping to, uh, to share and, and just, you know, what, why, why now, all, the, all those questions? Well, first of all, I never, and I still don't believe I'm, I'm that interesting, but I realized when you're around as long as I've been and, and in the same general area for as long as I've been. Yeah, you pick up a lot of interesting stories. The pandemic was a, a Kickstarter, even though I thought about it before then, it really propelled me to do it with, with my, my focus, you know, being home so much. Um, but I think it's uh, uh, having interviewed no less than 10,000 authors in a long career. I mean, seriously, I mean, I yeah. would do four a night sometimes. Having interviewed that many authors, and so I'm so familiar with the 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 story behind the story of how they do it, I, and I always wanted to try it. I never had the discipline that you have. I don't have the the skill sets that you have. So I I enlisted the uh, the aid of an old friend, 35 year friend, who um, helped me put it together, Steve White. But the point is. I just thought, you know, I share with my listeners all the time. Let me share with readers. And as a result, it took on a life as, well, you can help me with this. I mean, it sort of takes on a life of its own, even a, um, a true story, right? The things happen and it's sort of like a, a machine that gets rolling and a train that gets rolling. Do you, do you find that to be the case? Yeah. yeah I, just, you know, I mean, I always say way leads on to way and one story leads to another. You know, that's kind of how how I put my career together is just, you know, just seeing, seeing where the road run, running down the road as far as I can and finding another road. <laughs> yeah. And, and in my case, being a radio person and so used to format and so used to outlining a show and knowing where I want to go with each show and in each segment of the show, it was, it was formatted in sort of a radio way, but uh, along with stories about my career, which are, I think kind of interesting because everyone's career is unique. I wanted to share um, some of the personal stories too that people did know about who listened to the radio show. And people are sometimes surprised when they read about, you know, some of the things in the book, but I'm happy to discuss them anytime. But um, when I was on the air sharing some of those stories, 
I realized the impact was enormous. You know, that I, for me, it was great because I didn't feel I was alone. And for the audience, they felt they could talk about something since I had broached that subject. Yeah. So I decided, now eh, let's try a book. And uh, I can't tell you how exciting it is just to have one book. I mean, you've had several projects like this. It's a different kind of, uh, different kind of uh, vibe than just doing something on the air. It's really a, a nice legacy piece. Yeah. I mean, I, I know, you know for years people say, oh, you're a writer. Where's your book? Where's your book? Where's your book? And I kept, I had the ideas, but I kept back burnering them because, you know, the paid gig was more important than the Vanity Project. But, you know, the, the personal story that ties in with, with my book is that when my dad got diagnosed with dementia, I realized, you know, one of these needs to see the light of day. And if not now, when? And, you know, it took five years from that point. But, you know, I just, it really kept me going. And that's, in addition to having kind of a fun topic that a lot of people can relate to, that, that when that story comes out of how it came together, it, it, it brings in a lot of new, new elements to the, to the discussion. So I definitely- I, I would have loved to have known your father. You've spoken with me about him a lot. And, uh, and it's, it's a link to him and it's a dedication to him. I actually, just as we tape this, I'm in a different, I'm not in my usual habitat. I'm in New York State because I was able to reunite with my granddaughter, one of them, the other one had a little fever, so we didn't see her this time. And oh my God, the, the linkage is so important. And so in the book, I kept thinking, I want my grandchildren to just know the story, just as I want to know the story of my parents and their parents. So while I'm still kicking and healthy, I might as well give it a shot. And uh, um, the radio parts of it, are, it's funny, a lot of guys and gals, in the business have written me and say, oh, when you wrote about so-and-so or such-and-such, I, I could so commiserate <laughs> good and bad. Right. So that was nice. That was nice yeah. to hear that. Like you say, you have, you have to be well so you can do good, right? Well, thank you. That's, that's my sign off. Um, uh, you know, the old radio tradition is to have a, a, a sign off or a sign on or whatever. Right. And I came up with that uh, when I wasn't feeling my best and, uh, I was in a period where things were not going quite as well emotionally and mentally and physically. And I realized I had to put my oxygen mask on and get rolling. So be well makes sense, right? Take care of yourself. And then you can do all kinds of good things. So that's right. what I came from. Yeah. All right. I don't want to keep you away from, from your granddaughter or any of your family, but I, we, we do need to share a couple of favorite celebrity anecdotes. So what, what are like your top three uh, me memories of people you've interviewed, people you've met, you know, just encounters along the way. Uh, so many. I'll just start with one of my favorites, uh, the great Stan Lee, who was, of course, the Marvel creator, created Spider-Man and, and all those great characters, the X-Men. And I, he was uh, in his 80s at the time, and I interviewed him twice on the phone, twice. Both times, we had great interviews. The phones blew up at one in the morning. And both times I got in the mail, in the mail, personal thank you notes on Spider-Man stationery. Wow. Which I have, they were framed and saved. I loved him. He was just such a, he was like a little boy having so much fun in his late years. Um, so that one stands out. Uh, the great George Carlin, uh, one of my all time comedy heroes. I interviewed him a couple of times and uh, towards the, the, the end of his career, he was appearing locally and, uh, I took my son, who at the time was about 12, because he was a huge fan, and we went backstage, saw George. He was so kind, uh, so sweet, but nice to my son, Andrew. And it just, you know, his persona off off stage, at least with me, was was very nice. So these are t two giants. I mean, I have so many. I was, in, I was insulted by Don Rickles, which is a great honor. <laughs> okay, fuck you, fuck. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and the only other, uh, I mean, if you ask me top three, I mean, uh, there's so many gazillions. Of, I mean, from Celine Dion to Tony Bennett to all the great performers. I would say uh, Carl Reiner was another one. You may notice a trend here. They're all, you know, really older people. But, man, this is, a, this is the 2,000-year-old man. It's, it's Alan Brady from the Dick Van Dyke Show. And we just lost him last year. And he, Carl Reiner was a living legend. And he spent hours with me. I think we did four or five hours total. So those are just a few. And I, I, everybody in between, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I can't even remember. Yeah. 
but those come to you know, mind. I mean, it, it's, I, you know, I, I love telling my stories too, you know, especially when, you know, when the, when the, the gigs aren't coming so, so often or as often as you want, or when, you know, the business side isn't going so well to have one of those stories to kind of buoy you up for a little while longer. And with the hope that, you know, another one might come along, it can really, and I, you know, you've, you've made, you've made a, a 50 year career out of, out of be sharing these stories and meeting these people. In all seriousness, um, the, the, the non-celebrity stories probably mean more because yeah. touching letters, important correspondence, connections, uh, gifts, things like that, people really appreciate as they do a great column that you're writing, as they, they depreciate somebody who takes the time to deliver entertainment that's aimed at them. And the, the gratitude of the audience, so many of them, blew me away, still does, it impressed me. When I left my full-time, full-time, part-time, call it what you will, show on BZ in the late night weekends after 21 years or so, when I left in 2016, I left on my own free will power. And it was really interesting, Matt, how uh, people were so, they weren't crying and sad and thrashing their, their bodies, I didn't, thank God, but they were appreciative. And they said, you know what, we, we just want to say thank you. So many people said that. We understand why you decided to have a life again <laughs> with sleep and everything. And I, I treasure those moments. I, I really have a connection to an audience that is so genuine and so rare that I'm very, very grateful, very blessed indeed. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's, you know, what I've loved so much about working with you and doing the, the food spots on Connoisseur's Corner. You know, I grew up in an independent, you know, family business and that was uh, kind of crushed by uh, a certain person from Arkansas, you know, um, and, um, you know, so to be able to help the, the, you know, the woman or man who, you know, I started making brownies in my basement and now I'm selling them at farmer's market, you know, people that really are trying to, to make something and to be able to support them and tell their stories because, you know, they're not going to be on Shark Tank or at BJ's or, you know, or maybe eventually they will, but to be able to kind of be there at the beginning has been very gratifying and, and you really make a very personal connection. Well, let me just say this and uh, kudos to Matt because I'm the vessel. I provide the show, the segment, and I'm the host. But Matt, what you do is you, you bring together community and form a new community. And we've got, uh, let's talk about Needham. We've talked about so many places in Needham and so many great new opportunities and old standbys into, on the food scale that, I mean, I couldn't, ever expect to do this on my own i i need to have a colleague and a partner and uh you're one of our top guys in terms of connoisseur's corner uh i i don't know how many we've done together but it's got to be high hundreds if not thousands by now. yeah yeah it's it's up there but and it, everyone's been a pleasure and as as has this i, I want to let you get back to your family thank you so much for the time for the wonderful inspiring book i recommend everyone pick up a copy on air my 50 years uh, my 50 year love affair with radio. How can people get it? Is there uh, a website for the book or? Yeah, well, it, you can go to my website, jordanrich.com. It's very easy. Yeah. Uh, I'm very excited to announce that the audio version is finally out. And uh, I had to look far and wide for somebody to narrate this book, but I found uh, a guy who worked cheap. Uh, the, narr <laughs> the audio version is available. Uh, again, it's all in Amazon. And, and I should add, I, you probably mentioned this already, but that all proceeds that I receive, every penny that I receive is going directly to Boston Children's Hospital to a special fund. So if you purchase the book, realize that your money is well spent because it's not me. I don't need the money. It's going to a good cause. So thank you very much. It's uh, Amazon. You, any way to interact with you is, is time or money well spent. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, everyone, for, for watching. And we hope to see you soon on the Writer's Block.